Every serious hunter knows the importance of a sturdy morning meal. Incredible, man. So why is it that wild game rarely makes its appearance on our breakfast table? I can't believe how well that worked out. On this episode of Meat Eater, we're gonna help solve that problem. I'm sharing four of my favorite wild game breakfast recipes so you can enjoy the spoils of your kill all day long. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. If you think of how many times you've been invited to or heard about a wild game dinner, no one has ever had you to a wild game breakfast. So we're gonna try exploring a handful of great wild game breakfast preparations. First thing I wanna start with is bacon, probably because bacon is the biggest hunter's conundrum. In wild game, one of the few places I ever really see the right fat to meat ratio is on fall black bear. Bear fat has a lot of similarities to pork fat. I'm definitely not the first guy to try to make an approximation of bacon out of bear meat. In frontier times in America, a lot of commercial hunters would hunt bear just to make bacon. Daniel Boone spent a lot of his time, made a lot of his money hunting for deer hides and hunting for bear meat, so he would sell something called bear bacon. He would come out, tap sugar maples, cook that all the way down into a sugar, go to salt licks, boil down the water to get salt, and he would make a salt and maple syrup cured bear meat, which he would then smoke and cook and sell to people. This fall, I was hunting in British Columbia and killed a black bear that had been feeding real heavily on berries and he had a nice layer of fat on him. You would never want to make bear bacon with bears that have been feeding on salmon. Their fat really picks up that dead fish smell. But on a bear that's been feeding on berries, it's a nice fat. People actually say that it almost smells like berries. When I was butchering this bear, I noticed in crosscut that it kind of resembled that layer of fat interlaid with meat on commercial bacon. This is the fat over the animal's rump. This should be white. There's a little bit of purple on here because this bear rolled way down a mountain and he got bruised up on his way down. Bear with me, this is like an experimental thing. I haven't actually done it. We're gonna find out together if it works, but I'm confident that it's gonna be kind of a solution to that lifelong dilemma of how do you get bacon in the woods. This piece of meat has been in the cure for five days. A little bit of this color you're seeing is the fact that it is already cured and it's already very firm. But I'm gonna walk through the steps to demonstrate what one needs to do. I'm gonna start out with a cup of brown sugar. And this is for a three pound block of meat. Do two cups of coarse salt, teaspoon of pink salt number one. It's a preservative. It gives it a nice red color and helps fight contamination. I'm gonna mix this up pretty good. I'm gonna add in the syrup. And it makes it real sticky, so it wants to bind real nice to the meat. Take the brine ingredients, and I want to pack them on here. Work it in. Okay, now that I got a good, solid coating on here, I'm going to let it brine for a while. The best thing, if you have access to it, is just to put it in a vacuum bag and vacuum seal it. The nice thing about sealing it like this is it keeps the brine on the meat. There's a seal across the top, so you don't need to worry about making such a mess. So now I'm gonna just lay this in my fridge for a few days. The salt's gonna pull out a lot of liquid. Flip it over, just rebase it, and every couple of days, flip it back and forth. You wanna leave it in the fridge for about five days until the meat is nice and firm. The brine mixture is too salty to eat, so we're gonna give this thing a real good bath. Before it goes in the smoker, it needs to be dry. Pat it dry first with towel. Get as much of the moisture off as I can. Let it continue drying, put it in the fridge, and it'll dry fast in there. And should feel a little bit sticky to the touch. I wanted to get this thing to 150. It's got a more cooked look to it than store bacon. It's bear meat, so I mean, there's a very good chance it has trichinosis, so we're safe there on the cooking. I went a little bit over, but I still think we're gonna be okay. I'm 
bear's a lot darker. It's like a mahogany color. So you need the fat right now. It's good. It tastes like good charcuterie, you know? It's very pork-like. When I was a kid, when we went camping, my old man would always make toad in the hole on his tabletop Coleman cooker. I've heard it called hen in the nest. One of my friends just pointed out that this should be called bear in the cave. You'll see where it gets its name from in a second here. Butter both sides of the bread. Standard drinking glass, bore a hole through the bread. Save this, because this is the, actually turns out being the best part. OK, so we got bear in the den, toad in the hole, hen in the nest, or bear bacon. And then a little piece of side, butter saturated toast. Now, if you really want to impress your boyfriend or girlfriend, put a little orange on there. It makes it go from seeming like a real heavy meal to sort of light and festive. When it's done properly, the toast has a nice crisp to it. A yolky egg, which is perfect right there. The bacon, you can finger food it. That's the fatty part. It's not like bacon bacon, but if I had to pick one or the other the rest of my life, I'd go with bear bacon over commercial pork bacon without a question. The next breakfast item is corned beef hash. In this case, we're gonna make corned elk. And you can use any hooved mammal for this preparation. Making corned beef hash is considered to be pretty simple if you already have the corned beef. But what we're gonna do is back it way up. We're gonna make some from scratch. And the corning process is a slow brining process seasoned with pickling spice for several days, and then you slow cook it. It's the same thing as you eat on St. Paddy's Day. This elk is bull elk from Kentucky. And historically, there definitely were elk in Kentucky, and people hunted them there and ate them and sold byproducts from elk. But by the mid-1800s, they were gone. So there's a reintroduced herd there put in by Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. This bull was killed very near a reclaimed coal mine. Corned beef is traditionally done as a brisket dish, so it's a piece of meat that sits right here on an animal's chest. On wild game, there's not much brisket to speak of, but I find it's much better to use big chunks of shoulder. The silver skin's still on it, bone's still in it. It doesn't matter because there is no animal on Earth who is tough enough to have his flesh withstand the corning and cooking process. You could probably tenderize a rock doing what we're gonna do to this thing. So I like to have all that connective tissue. It's gonna be very tender, and it gets a gelatinous, slicker, glossier quality meat to it. This is a good preparation for tough cuts. So I'm going to use two cups of salt, half a cup of sugar, pink salt, and a commercial pickling spice. You can find this stuff in most every grocery store. It smells great, it's ready to go, and it's easy to use. Once this has been boiled and re-chilled, and all the salt and sugar is dissolved in there, submerge this piece of meat. And if you need to, you can weight it down with a ceramic plate or anything just to hold it in place. This is about a four pound piece of meat. Anywhere between three and five pounds, I would say you want to brine them in your refrigerator for about four or five days. After the four or five day brining process, I just want to clean it off, so give it a good rinse. You can slow cook corn meat in your oven or in a crock pot, but I like to use a pressure cooker. What would normally take five or six hours is done in 45 minutes. So once this thing starts going, I'm gonna check the time. I'm gonna cook it at 10 pounds of pressure for about 45 minutes. In the meantime, I'm gonna set some potatoes to boil. While the elk is cooking, I chop the other ingredients needed for the hash. Boil the potatoes until they are fork tender. Here, I'm using Yukon Gold. Let's see if we need to do more time or if we got it right. You want this very fork tender. Oh, that's perfect. That's gonna be great. Breaks away just like corned beef. It's got the nice color. It's got perfect taste. Oh, it's wonderful.
I'm gonna chop up this much of the corned elk. You can kind of break the corned elk up, or you can break it and chop it. For actually assembling the hash, maybe a cup and a half, two cups of potato, equal amount of corned elk, onion, garlic, parsley, and egg. Saute the onion and garlic first. You want the onion to become a little translucent and the garlic to become aromatic. Add in the potatoes and cook until everything starts to get nice and brown. Now it's time to just add in parsley. Then I'm gonna put in the corned elk. And this corned elk, right, you can cook it way ahead of time and leave it in your fridge for days before actually making the dish. You don't need to do all this at once. You could have it for dinner, use the leftovers, boil some potatoes the night before, and assemble this whole thing very quickly in the morning. A little salt and pepper. Here is one of those cooking moments when experience trumps all else. You're trying to find the right blend of crispy and not crispy, and you just gotta know it when you see it. I'll be plating this hash with a couple of eggs, served sunny side up. Top off with a little parsley. It winds up being a beautiful breakfast because we have the yellow of the Yukon gold potato, the orange yolk, got the white of the egg, a little bit of crisp on the potatoes, that nice vibrant red meat. You can sell this thing in a restaurant. It's a complete breakfast, you know? A little bit of toast might be all right, but it's very good, very satisfying. And then, for lunch, you get yourself some creamed horseradish and some bread, and you have corned elk sandwiches. Now, at dinner time, you can boil some potatoes and onions and cabbage and have a St. Patty's Day dinner. Our next breakfast dish, I'm doing one of my favorite sausages, which is called merguez. And it finds its origination in North Africa. It's traditionally made with lamb, mixed with red pepper and a variety of other seasonings. And it's put into lamb casings. And lamb casing is hard to work with. It's very fragile. You can't get away with a lot of mistakes on it because it'll, it'll burst on you. Rather than using lamb, I'm gonna use British Columbia moose. And this is a special moose because when he was wounded, he got up and ran at oh me. Oh my God. Oh Run! Oh my God. Knocked me over. And I ran away and my buddy finished him off. And it was kind of a tense couple of seconds there. That was fun. So I'll always remember this guy and I'll be sad when he's all eaten up. And I'm gonna cut it with black bear back fat or rump of a bear. Generally when you're making sausage, I typically will use 25% back fat, 75% lean red meat. Here I'm doing two pounds of lean red moose. And I'm doing one full pound of black bear back fat because the back fat still has a little bit of meat on it. First, cut your lean meat and fat into cubes. So I'm gonna take here my two pounds of moose meat and put it in my mixing bowl. And I got my mixing bowl set in ice because I want to keep everything very cold. Cold bear fat. Now I'm putting in about a cup and a half of roasted red pepper. And this really gives like merguez what it is because it's a very red sausage. I'm gonna stir that in. I'm now gonna add in sugar, salt, a few pinches of red pepper flakes, black pepper, paprika. And then here I have fennel and coriander that I toasted in a pan and then pulverize it in a coffee grinder. Put that in there. Work all this stuff in really good. It's best to mix your seasonings in with your meat and fat before you run it through the grinder. First, I run the meat through the coarse plate, then mix it up a little bit. And then I'm gonna do a second pass through a fine plate. Now that the meat is double ground, add in one third cup of very, very cold red wine. I add ice to the wine, keep it in the fridge, and then strain it as I mix it in. Okay, now it almost has a feel like bread dough. Now it goes into the stuffer. Get in there, get most of the air out. Okay, now I always practice safe sausage making. So I'm gonna put this here prophylactic looking thing onto 
It's better if you have someone to help you do this, but then you gotta put up with all their jokes. Lamb casing can be hard to work with because it wants to break. So you have to be gentle. Okay, we're gonna tie this one off. Lay it on a slightly oiled pan. I'm gonna cook it just in a round like this. This is kind of a traditional way to present this sausage. Bake it in a 300 degree oven. Get it up to 160 if you're using wild pork or bear meat, 150 for everything else. Now with the merguez, I'm gonna serve it with poached eggs. I like to get about three inches of water. I'm gonna add about that much vinegar. And I got a good strong boil going. I have at hand paper towel, slotted spoon, cold eggs. You wanna very gently lay the egg in there. French colonized so many areas in Africa, and they brought the merguez home with them. So my relationship with merguez comes from little French bistros and stuff. The salad's dressed with just olive oil and a squeeze of lemon. And you got toast, some strawberry in there for nice color. Looks pretty, don't it? The sausage links, soft poached eggs. The yolk is still very much alive in there. My little three-year-old calls them dippers. And the salad's really nice. And then the sausage, get in there, get a little yolk. It's a much more subtle sausage than standard Italian or breakfast sausage. It's got like a little bit of bite. You can taste the red pepper, you can taste the paprika. It's like kind of a more refreshing type breakfast with the poached eggs and the salad. But it's very good. The final breakfast dish we're gonna do is called the scotch egg. And I stole this recipe from the chef April Bloomfield. She describes this dish as being breakfast in one bite because it's an egg wrapped in sausage and then breaded and deep fried. At one of her restaurants, she serves it as a bar snack, so it's good night or morning. The first step, making the sausage. I got a California wild boar it's feeding on pasture grasses, also feeding on some acorns. I boned out that pig's shoulder. Those wild pigs are very lean, so I cut in domestic pork back fat. So I got about three parts lean wild boar to one part back fat, and I ran it through a grinder twice. And I'm gonna kind of build a really simple sage sausage. So I'm gonna put maybe about that much salt in there and just kind of do it by look. The next step is I have sage, which has been pulverized with a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of salt. It turns into kind of a paste, and I'm gonna put in it looks like a good amount. I might add a little more once I start mixing it. And then the next thing, I'm gonna take equal parts milk and breadcrumb, because this has to be like a very pliable, very malleable sausage. That's just breadcrumb I made in a food processor. Let it thicken up. This gets a sort of oatmeal consistency. I'm gonna need to cut all that in. So now I'm gonna mix this by hand and see how it looks and feels. As far as the egg goes, you want a soft boiled egg, which means you can peel it just like a hard boiled egg. It'll feel a little more jiggly and it's got a soft yolk. Put some eggs in a pot of water. Once the thing gets to a boil, give them six, six and a half minutes, they'll be soft boiled. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, the goal now is to take about four ounces of this business right here and encase this egg like you're wrapping it up in a cocoon. The watch. April Bloomfield do this. It's just like, whoosh, and there it is. But I don't think it's gonna be that way for me. We're gonna try. Okay, I like that. That's nice. Now, dip this in flour, egg, panko. Get it back in a nice shape again. And now, I'm gonna lay this guy right in the deep fryer. OK, 
Okay, so we did six minutes at 375 degrees Fahrenheit, 190 Celsius, and it's beautiful. Okay, now is the moment of truth. We're gonna cut into this thing. This is like when Geraldo opened Al Capone's vault. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. That's pretty gorgeous. So there we have scotch egg, the ultimate breakfast item. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible. It goes especially well with a breakfast beer. I can't believe how well that worked out. This is like demystifying a mystical person for me by being able to do this. I like to try to look at chefs who I admire, like what are they doing? And then I ask myself, could I do something similar using game meat? Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, but it's always adventurous. In this case, it's a pretty simple thing, using wild pig that I killed myself to make a sage sausage, and it's just turned out wonderfully. I'm glad to have ended with this one. This is just the perfect nighttime snack.